Welcome to our Elodium webinar presentation on eight ways to enhance donor trust by improving your investment stewardship. We are happy that you set aside some time to join us today, and we hope to provide you with a practical roadmap to action for nonprofit leaders. I'm Dave Brummelkamp with Elodium Investment Consultants in Minneapolis, and I'll be your host for today's presentation. We have invited two experienced fiduciary experts to help us to learn eight ways to improve our investment stewardship. Both of our speakers today are with Fiduciary Path, a firm that is dedicated to helping investors to improve their investment decision-making process. Kate McBride is the founder and president of Fiduciary Path. She is an accredited investment fiduciary and a CFEX analyst with more than 40 years of investment industry experience. Alan Henriquez is a fiduciary consultant with Fiduciary Path. He is also an accredited investment fiduciary analyst and also a CFEX analyst. Now I will give you a brief introduction to set the table for their presentation. We've asked Kate and Alan to develop a presentation to provide nonprofit leaders uh, with some action steps to improve their investment stewardship. We know that do donors are concerned about investment stewardship. And so we're constantly looking for practical ideas for nonprofit leaders that can bring their, uh, that can bring their organizations to improve their investment decision-making process. Kate and Alan have a three-part presentation. Today, we're gonna to discuss today's realities with some background information. Secondly, building a fiduciary culture. And thirdly, eight ways to get to fiduciary. We've budgeted 30 minutes for the formal presentation and then 30 minutes for a Q&A session after the formal presentation is complete. As we go through the presentation, feel free to use the chat function in the Zoom meeting to submit any questions that you might have about the presentation. Uh, you might also offer up some examples of challenges that your organization might be having related to investing. We will plan to address all of your questions in the Q&A session at the end of the formal presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to Kate to start our presentation. Thanks so much, Dave, for, for having us today. We're really excited about uh, talking to everyone. Thanks for joining us, everyone. So let's jump right in. Think about this for a moment. For a nonprofit, reputation is everything. Yet less than half of nonprofit directors think their board has a solid understanding of their responsibilities. So maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that one in four people, one in four, don't trust charities. Looks like a great opportunity for you to distinguish your organization from the, uh, the other nonprofits out there. But how do you go about that? So let's set the stage, Kate. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the roles and responsibilities of nonprofit lay fiduciaries, the ultimate decision makers, like the people on this call who are board members and execs of nonprofits. Do you know how many nonprofit lay fiduciaries there are and how much money they're responsible for? It's really not an easy task to find out. There's no uniform data source but we can begin to get an idea from the informational tax returns required by the U.S. Department of Labor and the Internal Revenue Service, as well as more informal sources. The Center for Board Certified Fiduciaries recently released a report that estimates there are at least 17 million lay fiduciaries who control over $26 trillion of investments. That's trillion with a T. <clears throat> if we take a closer look at the report that the center prepared, in 2016, there were at least 1.6 million nonprofits registered with the IRS. And as of 2018, the lay fiduciaries responsible for these nonprofits were also responsible 
for managing 4.9 trillion of that 26 trillion dollars overall. When we dig even a little deeper into the details, we can see that public charities account for about $4.9 trillion. Private foundations account for $1.2 trillion. And apprenticeship trusts, a measly $12.5 billion. These numbers are significant. There are more than 12 million lay fiduciaries in charge of public charities and a much smaller number, 375,000 in charge of private foundations with an estimated 168 in charge of apprenticeship trusts. So you can see that apprenticeship is just a little sliver of the, the nonprofits out there. But the average used of eight fiduciaries per public charity, that actually may be conservative. Form 990s show, filed with the IRS show that the average number of voting directors for 501c3 organizations was 13. How does your organization compare? And why is that important? If nearly half of nonprofit board members don't think their fellow board members really understand their job or are doing a good job, that's around 6 million nonprofit board members who are likely falling short of meeting their responsibilities in managing trillions of dollars. Now, you're on this, this Zoom call, so you're probably not one of them, but how many board members in your organization might be? And what should you do about it? Well, that's why we're here. In an article entitled Billion Squandered, the Chronicle of Philanthropy summarizes a study of 40,000 foundations with endowments over a million dollars. And that they looked at their tax filings, the Form 990s, to gather this data. For the five years ending in December 2016, the annualized rate of return on investments was 7.7%. That's how much the investments grew each year for the foundations. Compare that with the 9.04% annualized rate of return for the Vanguard Global 70% Stock 30% Bond Fund. That's an inexpensive diversified mutual fund that virtually anyone can buy. The top 25% of the foundations did only slightly better than this Vanguard mutual fund. If someone asks you, how does your organization compare that with this? Do you know? You think it might be important to know how your investments are doing generally, as well as compared to your peers. The study also found that small changes in investment returns can make a big difference. Here's an example. Let's say your nonprofit has $100 million of assets invested. Each percentage point of gain or loss in the investment returns, what you earn on those investments, would be a million dollars or more, a uh, million dollars more, uh, or a million dollars less, as the case may be. So up 1% would be a million dollars more each year for your mission. Small changes in investment expenses also make a very big difference. For that same $100 million endowment, 1% more in costs would mean a million dollars less each year for your mission. That's why costs are important. Think about that. If this is your organization with $100 million investing, 1% less in costs would mean a million dollars more per year that you can have available for your mission and your intended beneficiaries. So do your own math. What does that mean for you? What could you do each year with those extra dollars and how would it increase your impact? That's really the bottom line. So to understand this really, you have to put it into context. Most nonprofits annually distribute or gift 5% of their endowment funds. So that means this 1% more or less is equal to 20% of your annual distribution, distribution or gifting budget. So that's really significant. All right, let's talk now about who is a fiduciary and what does that mean? A fiduciary is an individual who manages assets on behalf of others or is responsible for the management of those assets and is therefore in a special position of responsibility and trust. 
In the case of a foundation or endowment, board members, the investment committee, and staff all have a hand in carrying out the objectives of the foundation, including management of its assets. And we say management of its assets, but that doesn't mean that you have to do this yourself. In fact, unless you have specialized investment expertise, you should hire prudent experts, professional fiduciaries, to manage the assets in the best interest of the organization and the mission and beneficiaries. The fiduciaries, the, the lay fiduciaries, board members, trustees, the investment committee, and staff have legally defined roles and obligations to carry out those roles according to a standard of care. In general, when you're in a position to make or influence investment, administrative, or financial decisions for a foundation, it's highly likely that you will be considered a fiduciary for those decisions. And that means you need to know what your fiduciaries are and how to fulfill them. Um, this is the bottom line of what we're talking about. If you're on a board or in a decision-making role with your organization, you are a fiduciary. Fiduciary excellence leads to trust. Trust leads to enhanced donor confidence and board engagement, which leads to increased donations, financial security, and mission success. That's why you and all your board members joined your organization. So the word fiduciary is derived from the Latin word for trust. Certain people are entrusted with special obligations to act faithfully on behalf of others. These are typically people with special skills who faithfully serve those who depend on them. Fiduciary principles are the oldest and most revered concepts in law. Their history can be traced back more than 4,000 years to the Code of Hammurabi and in the um, ancient texts of the major religions like the Golden Rule in Christianity. In Roman times, some 2,000 years ago, the fiduciary standard became more formalized. This quote captures the concept of fiduciary accountability superbly. We simply can't do everything ourselves. We have to trust others to competently and ethically apply their skills. When a fiduciary breach occurs, there's harm not only to those who are directly dependent on fiduciaries, but overall society suffers as well. If we can't hold fiduciaries accountable, the basis for trusting people in special positions of responsibility is undermined. Most modern fiduciary laws that we operate under today originate from the common law of the courts of equity in the United States and England, dating back over 250 years, in which the courts would grant relief in situations where an abuse of confidence resulted in personal damage. So again, let's put this into perspective. If we're going to build a fiduciary culture, what does it actually look like? It's a state of mind plus a systematic process based on a common language or vocabulary and the best fiduciary practices based on the law, relevant regulations, and practical experience. It's designed to increase trust inside and outside of your organization. A direct result will be more effective management and your reputation will be enhanced, thereby having more confident donors. In other words, you'll have improved outcomes, and I'm sure that's something everybody here wants for their organization. Jargon. We'd like to ban it. <laughs> we see that most people join a nonprofit to be involved in the good work of the mission. But most board members and trustees don't have an investment vocabulary, which is understandable because most are not professional investors. We have a solution for that. We have a reference book, The Language of Fiduciaries. We've made it available at no cost as a PDF. So there's a, a, a link to it in the back of the, the deck here. There are a few items that you might need to be familiar with, such as lay fiduciary or investment steward. That's most of you if you're a trustee or on the board of a nonprofit. The custodian, that's usually a bank or a brokerage firm that holds investment securities for safekeeping to minimize the risk of theft or loss. 
and the custodian will also buy and sell investments as directed by you or the professional fiduciaries to whom you've delegated authority to manage the portfolio. Think of a portfolio as a basket or pool of the cash and investment securities that the foundation must prudently manage, a basket of them. There may be more than one portfolio. And what's in that portfolio? Well, it's the cash and the investment securities, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, maybe other kinds of investments. You might also have a portfolio that includes less liquid, maybe donated real estate or art. These are all referred to collectively as assets. Think of the language of fiduciaries as your quick reference source for any of the terms you're not sure of. Now that you have a broad sense of what the word and concept of fiduciary means, let's talk about who makes up the universe of fiduciaries. Generally, there are three types of fiduciaries involved in the investment of the assets. Stewards, also described as lay fiduciaries, then advisors, and investment managers. Although the three types are typically separate entities, their roles do intersect and therefore they become interdependent for ensuring the complete scope of the responsibilities are being fulfilled. Stewards generally bear overall responsibility for selecting advisors and approving investment managers. That's really important. You don't have to do this yourself, uh, but you do have to select the right advisors and investment managers to help you. So who is a fiduciary? There are three major types of actions that make you a fiduciary, and they align closely with these three main fiduciary roles. You are a fiduciary if you can appoint other fiduciaries, like if you're on the board and, and you can appoint the investment committee, that makes you a fiduciary. Or if you're an investment, or if you're an investment professional hired to provo provide professional advice, or if you use discretion over assets or investments, or if you're in a decision-making capacity and making or implementing investment decisions, as opposed to investment recommendations, then you are also by default considered to be fiduciaries. Those last two are professional fiduciaries. This is typically associated with investment managers, but it can also be an investment advisor or an investment steward known as a lay fiduciary, like many of you. If you have the authority to direct the purchase or sale of assets on behalf of the nonprofit. So nonprofit board members, trustees, executive, executives, and decision makers are fiduciaries, lay fiduciaries generally. Professionals that are hired to provide professional advice, that's typically a fiduciary role because as a professional, they're in a position of control because they were specifically retained to give specialized guidance. And that's what makes an investment advisor a professional fiduciary. And finally, those who exercise discretion or the authority uh, to make investments over assets, such as those who are making and implementing investment decisions are also by default considered to be fiduciaries. But keep in mind, someone making investment recommendations may not be a fiduciary. And that's an important thing to know because when you're getting advice or recommendations from an investment professional, not all investment professionals are fiduciaries. So to find out what their fiduciary status is, and uh, so you need to find out what their fiduciary status is, and you need to have that in writing in a contract and an investment policy. One more thing to keep in mind, you can become a fiduciary simply by performing a fiduciary function. Functional fiduciary status can even apply without the individual even realizing it. This is an important concept to understand because anyone wishing to avoid fiduciary status must understand what lines not to cross. So Kate's told you um, who is a fiduciary. Let's take a look at who isn't a fiduciary. And while fiduciaries act in a special relationship of trust and confidence because of the high degree of independent decision-making they exercise on behalf of others, non-fiduciaries tend to be more focused on execution of defined job tasks. They're typically directed to perform certain roles or tasks, such as holding or accounting for assets or executing trades, and the key point, at the discretion of the fiduciaries. Brokers who act strictly as directed to buy or sell securities and otherwise do not take an active role in managing investments or providing advice 
are not likely to be acting in a fiduciary capacity and generally are not fiduciaries. Similarly, custodians who hold and handle the assets for a nonprofit entity would not normally be considered fiduciaries. Accountants, auditors, and others involved in tending the books and records of a foundation's assets would also not generally be considered fiduciaries. These roles and others like them are non-fiduciary in nature because they generally are not empowered to engage or confer fiduciary status on others. They're not generally relied upon for professional advice or authorized to exercise discretion in investment decision making. That's a key point there. They, just, they don't generally have the authorization to exercise discretion in investment making, investment decision making. It's ultimately the responsibility of the stewards, you the board members, to know the fiduciary status of the service providers that you engage. Agreements with all parties should specifically spell out what duties will be performed and whether those duties are fiduciary in nature. Let's take a look at the most fundamental duties owned, owed by a fiduciary to those they serve. The duties of loyalty, care, and obedience represent the foundation of fiduciary responsibility and underlie all other requirements. The fiduciary standard is principles-based, which means that a fiduciary is expected to abide by a set of guiding principles. The duty of loyalty requires that fiduciaries must not act in their own self-interest at the expense of those they serve. The duty of loyalty also requires that a fiduciary manage conflicts of interest to the exclusive benefit of the objectives of the foundation or trust. The duty of care is more focused on process. It encompasses many other obligations, including that the fiduciary be competent. And that means acting with the same level of care, skill, prudence, and diligence that a prudent person who is an expert and acting in a similar capacity and familiar with the underlying circumstances would employ. That's actually what's in the law. And that means that a steward, a lay fiduciary, is required to delegate to a qualified expert if that lay fiduciary doesn't have the skills that the expert fiduciary has. The duty of care requires that the fiduciary demonstrate good judgment, knowledge, and diligence when acting on someone else's behalf. And by demonstrate, that means employing consi consistent and objective processes to provide documentation and provide documentation of those consistent and objective processes. So, you know, meeting minutes and notes, things like that are important. The duty of obedience recognizes that decision-making authority has boundaries. Fiduciaries must be dedicated to fulfilling the organization's mission, knowledgeable and obedient to the applicable laws and regulations, and conscientious about following the governing documents, like the trust documents or any other governing and founding documents of the nonprofit. There are eight fiduciary precepts that underline and provide guidance for any fiduciary. And let's go through, let's walk through those quickly. The first precept law is the requirement to know the standards, laws, trust provisions, founding documents, and other rules impacting your nonprofit. Seems pretty obvious, but oftentimes people don't look at those documents. The second precept, discover, or excuse me, diversify, requires that the investment portfolio be prudently diversified to meet a specific risk and return profile. And that's also sometimes called asset allocation. The third precept, the investment policy statement or IPS, is the preparation and maintenance of the overall investment policy statement. It's the most critical function a fiduciary performs. The IPS is a formal, long-range strategic plan that defines the management of the investment program in a logical and consistent framework. The IPS is the business plan that guides the activities 
of those managing your nonprofit assets. So a key point here is if you haven't taken a look at it recently, you should look at your investment policy statement for your organization. You may have more than one for different pools of money, but that is, as we mentioned, the most critical function a fiduciary performs. The fourth precept, service providers, means implementing an effective due diligence process using appropriate prudent experts. A fiduciary should be able to demonstrate that a due diligence process was followed in selecting and monitoring each investment option as well as each service pro provider. Right. The fifth precept, costs, <laughs> requires fiduciaries to control and account for all investment related expenses. The fiduciary has a responsibility to know the amount each party that has been compensated from investment assets uh, and to ensure that no service provider is unduly compensated, meaning the service providers uh, must be reasonably com com compensated. The sixth precept, conflicts, requires the fiduciary to avoid prohibited transactions and conflicts of interest. In practice, this fundamental duty requires conflicts to be identified and avoided, or if they cannot be avoided, the lay fiduciary or steward must manage those investment decisions to resolve such conflicts in a matter consistent with the objectives and mission of the organization. The seventh precept, monitor, requires fiduciaries to monitor the investment program and supervise the activities of the investment managers and other service providers that you've hired. Monitoring is an ongoing process where mistakes are often made but can be corrected, primarily because of the tendency be to become complacent. Being, uh, being acknowledged and corrected is very, very important here if a mistake is made. And then the eighth precept, assess conformity, calls upon the fiduciary to monitor and assess how well the organization is conforming to its own fiduciary obligations. Periodic assessments of the fiduciary policies, procedures, and practices in place for the organization not only assure conformity to fiduciary obligations, but it promotes continual improvement in a changing environment. The eight precepts shown on the screen form the foundation of a prudent fiduciary process. They summarize the actual responsibilities that you're held accountable for in your role as a caretaker of the assets belonging to your nonprofit but you can consider them a roadmap to success as an investment fiduciary. Here's a quick, easy way for you to think about your operations as a fiduciary, the fiduciary quality management system from FI360. It's been around for a little over 20 years, and this framework addresses the fiduciary responsibilities in the investment process and is modeled after the ISO 9000 standard, the International Organization of Standardization Standard for Quality Management Systems. It's a process-driven approach and includes the concept of continual improvement, two principles that go hand in hand with carrying out your responsibilities as a fiduciary. You can see the four major continuous steps, organize, which is the data gathering phase, formalize, which is the data analysis and strategy building phase, implement, which is the execution phase, and monitoring, which is the review evaluation and course correction phase. And then once you've gone through all four, you go back to number one and start again. It's a continuous cycle to reinforce the idea of continual improvement and constantly reevaluating the assumptions, process, and strategy that are a part of your decision making. Thanks, Alan. Let's break down the steps. Step one of the fiduciary quality, quality management system, organized, is all about collecting the information necessary for making investment decisions on behalf of your nonprofit and building awareness among your decision makers. Step two is the formalized step. And it's all about establishing your ground rules for what you plan to accomplish with your investments and how you plan to do that. Step three, implement, is where you likely with the fiduciary pros that are helping you implement the investment strategy. 
The easiest way to describe this step is that it is the due diligence phase armed with the investment strategy that you've helped to build and based on the data you've gathered and analyzed. Now you go through the process of seeing that strategy through by engaging service providers and making the investment selections with the help of the professional fiduciaries you've hired. Step four, monitoring is the most labor intensive part of your job as a lay fiduciary or steward because it's an ongoing responsibility. It requires you to draw on the information that was gathered during the and, and the governance structure that was established during the organized and formalized steps. And it also requires you to assess the decisions that were made in the implement step to determine if adjustments need to be made. And that's very, very typical, common that, that you have to make adjustments as you go. And finally, to respond to the changing conditions in the markets like we've experienced this year, while maintaining the highest level of fiduciary governance. Number seven, ongoing fiduciary training helps deepen fiduciary knowledge for current leadership and introduce incoming leadership to fiduciary best practices. It helps keep your board engaged and shows boards how to delegate many fiduciary tasks to those professional fiduciaries so that they don't carry all of the fiduciary responsibilities on the board's shoulders. Training helps lay fiduciaries show donors that they take stewardship of those donors' donations seriously. Live customized fiduciary training is available on site by, or, or via Zoom uh, through our website, Fiduciary Path. Uh, we have on-demand online fiduciary essentials training, and that's available at your convenience. And then the eighth step in the fast track to fiduciary excellence, train and engage your leadership to put your organization on the fast track to fiduciary excellence. The first step is fiduciary essentials training. This is the training program for lay fiduciaries, investment stewards like you. The next step is a fiduciary gas an gap analysis and fiduciary assessment. That's an informal way of seeing where you are in your fiduciary practices if you have gaps, and if you do, closing those gaps. The third step would be having an expert verify your organization's prudent practices and achieving an independent third party certification based on the standard outline in the handbook, Prudent Practices for Investment Stewards from FI360. We can help you effectively implement all three of these if you decide to join the elite circle of CFEX certified investment stewards. Thanks, Kate. Um, you know, when you look at these things, I think we'd all agree that nobody would jump in and do all of these at once tomorrow. And different organizations are at different stages along this continuum. You probably want to start by aligning these with your organization's objectives and priorities and determine where you are on your fiduciary continuum. One way a nonprofit leader might approach this is to look at these eight ways and say, we can pick one or two and get started, and then go ahead and reach out for help. As we summarize these eight ways, you may want to think about where are we, where is our organization? So here's a quick summary of the eight ways. Number one, know the three types of fiduciaries, investment stewards, otherwise known as lay fiduciaries, investment advisors, and investment managers. Number two, know who is a fiduciary and embrace your responsibilities as a fiduciary and the benefits it provides for you and your organization. Number three, know who isn't a few, a, easy for me to say, know who isn't a fiduciary. Number four, Know the three fundamental legal duties of a fiduciary, the duties of loyalty, care, and obedience. Number five, use the eight fiduciary precepts to begin to build your culture of fiduciary excellence. And those eight precepts are know the rules, the laws. Diversify your assets. You can have help with that. Have and follow an IPS, an investment policy statement. 
select prudent service providers using a prudent process like a request for proposal or something equivalent to that. Know your investment costs and control them. Avoid or manage conflicts of interest that cannot be avoided. Monitor your investments and service providers. Monitor how well your organization is meeting its fiduciary responsibility. Way six, it was use fiduciary, the fiduciary quality management system, the FQMS for short, organize, formalize, implement, and monitor. It's a virtuous circle and it really does work. Provide ongoing fiduciary training for your board and staff, all the decision makers. That's number seven. And number eight, put your nonprofit on the fast track to fiduciary excellence. Undertake a fiduciary gap analysis, fix the gaps, get independent third-party certification, and start with training. Thanks, Kate and Alan. That was a great uh, formal presentation. I appreciate the information. Um, today, we've covered uh, three areas. One is the today's realities with some uh, information about how things are affecting nonprofit organizations. We talked a little bit about building a fiduciary culture, and then we talked about the eight ways to get to fiduciary. So that covers a lot of good ideas on how to enhance donor trust by improving your investment stewardship. And I know that donors are becoming more interested in the quality of the management of the nonprofit organizations that they support. I also know that donors tend to make larger donations to the nonprofit organizations that they feel have the financial expertise to manage larger donations. Um, building a fiduciary culture requires focusing on many words that I heard in today's presentation, such as reputation, trust, stewardship, responsibility, and this big word called fiduciary. Your eight ways to get to fiduciary are some practical ideas that we can all use to improve our investment stewardship in the nonprofit organizations that we support and assist. My one takeaway is that ongoing fiduciary training for nonprofit leaders is one of the most important ideas for us to learn more about and to get engaged with to help us to be better leaders for the nonprofit organizations that we help. Now we're gonna open this discussion for any questions that the audience might have for Kate and Alan. Um, so if you have questions, you can uh, submit them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your um, uh, Zoom portal. A um, Couple of questions that I had, and I'll make, I'll make one note here that um, Kate and Alan did a presentation on a very similar subject for us in the past. Uh, on 15 ways to enhance donor trust by improving your investment stewardship. And Elodium actually drafted up a white paper that might be about 17 pages long. So it's really a good recap of this material. If anyone's interested, in fact, I'll probably have Ilona send that out to all the participants. So it'll give you a, a, a summary of this presentation in writing in a 17 page white paper. Um, but a lot of the questions and you know, I've actually been working with this material from FI360 for about 20 years. And when I joined a nonprofit board about 20 years ago, I basically said I wanted to introduce these fiduciary best practices to the nonprofit. And so uh, 20 years has gone by. 20 years ago, when I brought these ideas to the nonprofit, they looked at me like I was from Mars. And so now, I look at it 20 years later and I'm saying some nonprofit organizations still would think that we must be talking about this word fiduciary as something that we're like, we're coming from Mars. So my question is uh, how e every state in the union has laws that apply to the governance of nonprofit organizations. How do I learn more or how can our audience learn more about the state laws that apply to their organization? Um, well, Dave, I think um, probably the easiest way to do that is to go to your respective state attorney general's website. They will have a place on that website uh, that summarizes what the laws are re regarding public charities. And 
what the fiduciary responsibilities are uh, of all public charities domiciled in that particular state. <clears throat> Some of them even have um, training materials on there to provide additional information on topics that we've discussed today. But I think that's the very first place to start. And what I've found is most of those attorney general websites lay it out in non-legalese. It's very easy to understand and it just covers a lot of the information that we talked about here today. Another thing that I would strongly recommend that the nonprofit exec make a copy of and provide a copy to each board member, and that is a copy of your state's adoption of um, the Uniform Prudent Investor Act and the uh, Uniform Institutional uh, Management of Funds Act. Both of those lay out the specific fiduciary legal responsibilities that your organization and your board members have. So it's a good, good place to start. Great. Any follow-up there, Kate? I think Alan covered it. Um, you know, other other resources I would uh, potentially, you know, think would be very helpful would be the Center for Fiduciary Excellence. Uh, that They have a website that talks about what stewards, investment stewards, need to do to fulfill their fiduciary obligations. And they also have um, something called a self-assessment of fiduciary excellence, uh, which is, uh, depending on which version you, you get to, uh, about 30 questions or about 15 questions, uh, that basically you can ask yourself uh, and go down the list and see how you are meeting what is asked for in that self-assessment. Um, it's a great exercise for a foundation's board or leadership to do. Uh, Alan and I can help you if you would like to reach out to us. We are happy to go through that with you. Uh, it doesn't take that much time. Some of these things have great discussion points for boards uh, to really consider. Um, FI360, which wrote the book Prudent Practices for Investment Stewards, that's a great resource as well. That really lays out the fiduciary responsibilities for foundations and endowment stewards. Um, and all of these um, resources, their websites are in the resources section of this deck. So you can find those. Also, the Council on Foundations has um, really um, very broad uh, practices that you can, uh, you can see on their website. They talk about um, good governance a lot. Great. And so I'll go back to my experience on a nonprofit board is if I buy into this idea that I want the organization to adopt fiduciary best practices. And uh, I have other board members that are looking at me and they're saying, well, how do, how do we know that this information is credible or who do we actually look to to find the information that we need to kind of convince ourselves to aspire to uh, better investment stewardship? Um, because some people, you know, the way they make decisions or the way they contribute to a board of directors is they might say, um, let's get the best performing investment managers and the more money we make, the better, or let's get the lowest cost investment manager because that is what we're supposed to be doing. And we may all know that it's about the investment decision-making process and a prudent process. So how do we help people understand what is the credible what are the credible resources that are out there or the credible uh, training resources that can be used uh, for a board of a nonprofit board of directors? Think of yourself as being on a nonprofit board. How would you go about doing persuading your fellow board members to adopt fiduciary best practices? Right. I mean, it's part of good governance and, and leadership. And as one thing that Kate mentioned, the um, self-assessment for fiduciary excellence and the um, prudent practices for investment stewards handbook, 
that's been edited and approved by the American um, Society of CPAs. So this isn't just some crazy idea. It's stated in the law and the CPAs as a national organization have said, yes, this is what nonprofits should be doing. The big problem and the challenge is most nonprofit board members have never been told they're a fiduciary, much less yeah. what that means and what their response, what their responsibilities are. So the fact that you're here today checking this out is definitely a good good indication that you're with it, that you understand that these are things that you need to be doing and these resources that we've mentioned will help expedite that process. And I know both Kate and I are, are available to, you know, for a, a call at no cost to the people on this uh, conference today, just to take a look at your specific, an, an overview of your specific situation and any questions you may have. So that that's something that we're committed to doing this and uh, we recognize that more and more nonprofit organizations are beginning to realize how critical this is uh, for their success. I, and I'm, I'm just going to interject, you know, it's not just critical for the success of the nonprofit itself and the, the endowments that you may have that you're responsible for. If you have a retirement plan, it's also critical for that because we are seeing lawsuits for some of the most huge nonprofit institutions, places like NYU and Northwestern and, uh, you know, Harvard, Yale, and, and then many other places who, for nonprofits where the uh, investments of, for the plan are not uh, appropriately managed or the help is not what the help that you think you got. So there's a lot to unpack here. We are happy to help. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Great. Um, my next question is a series of questions about this uh, term you, you used called a fiduciary gap or gap analysis. And I think that uh, almost everybody that's on a nonprofit board or a non, you know, a staff or a leader in a leadership position at a nonprofit probably always understands that no organization is perfect. So there's always like gaps in almost everything that they're doing, whether it's governance gaps or, you know, investment decision-making gaps. So this idea of the gap analysis is, can you tell us what is a fiduciary gap analysis as it applies to a nonprofit organization? Yes, um, you know, we, we do a fair number of these. Uh, as a CFEX analyst, I've done quite a few of these. And where we start is the Center for Fiduciary Excellences uh, about a hundred questions in a gap analysis uh, about the processes that a uh, nonprofit goes through to engage uh, service providers that will act in their best interest to have an appropriate IPS investment policy statement that gives you the roadmap or the GPS, if you will, for the investments, uh, investment criteria, how to hire the, the service providers that you're going to have. Um, how to delegate, which is a word that you really need to know because it's a way of taking all the fiduciary responsibilities that are on your shoulders until you delegate them and delegating a lot of them to professional fiduciaries uh, and how to hire those professional fiduciaries. It's important to do it right because you want to make sure you're getting what you think you're getting. We see a lot of places where we're trying to uh, work through what they're doing and they may think that they have someone advising them that is a fiduciary when in fact they are not. One way to know it, whether you have a fiduciary advising you is to actually have a CFEX certified advisor, registered investment advisor. Uh, registered investment advisors by law have to be fiduciaries. If you end up with a different type of financial professional like a broker, or a dual registrant who might be a broker and an investment advisor, like how do you know when they're doing that, um, when when they're doing one versus the other. Um, I, I'm not really sure how that works. I've always thought that was very confusing. So, you know, 
Um, so finding a registered investment advisor, uh, and especially one that is certified by the Center for Fiduciary Excellence, that's a, a huge leap forward in knowing that you've got actual fiduciaries advising you. And they can help you uh, with your in investment policy statement and the asset allocation that you need to get to where you want that endowment or endowments to go. And they can also help you uh, select investment managers. Now, all those kinds of things uh, you work with them on and they you, you can delegate a lot of those responsibilities. There are some you can't delegate at all, but most of the responsibilities having to do with the investments you can delegate to a prudent fiduciary and they will help you. And it, it lifts so much fiduciary responsibility from your shoulders. Um, sorry, I had my phone turned off and it's not a, uh, it's not turning off. I don't know what's wrong. Sorry about that. Everybody's anyway. Trying to, um, everybody's trying to call and ask you more questions. Call and yeah. ask after. <laughs> so, uh, so the I was just going to say one, one thing I would add to Kate's comments um, as a practical matter. And I've done several, fiduciary gap analyses and CFAX certification reviews. And I've seen many others, and I've never seen one that didn't more than pay for itself in terms of savings and improved investment results for the nonprofit entity that was doing it. So it's one of those things that um, you really begin to understand, oh, if I just did this, that has this potential result over here, and it goes directly to your bottom line. And all of this, to put it in a bigger picture context, one of the key things we've talked about here is trust. The trust of your board, the trust of your beneficiaries, and most importantly, the trust of your donors. As Dave noted earlier, donors who make large contributions, one of the key things that they want to feel confident in is that they can trust your organization and your ability to properly manage whatever they're providing by way of gift to your organization. That's where being the fiduciary, that's where that really fits it's also where this gap analysis can help build your confidence and give you the ability to speak on specifics that will be of interest and enhance the trust of your donors. And ultimately, once you've got those gaps closed, getting an independent third party verification that you know what you're doing, that's a, that's a very key thing that hopefully this whole process ultimately leads to. Yeah, and once you do a gap analysis, the the lead to CFEX certification, a certified having a certified organization where you can display a symbol that's set. It's like the good housekeeping seal for a nonprofit, knowing what they're doing with in, with um, donor uh, donations is you know it's a big thing. But it's a small leap once you have your gap analysis done and your procedures are buttoned down. And that's what the gap analysis does. You go in. We look at the procedures, we talk about them. It can take months, uh, but it, but it's worth the effort because it, uh, it really does make a difference in how you can talk to donors and how donors think of you because you've taken the time to understand that you you have these responsibilities and some of them can be delegated and you've delegated to prudent experts and, that know what they're doing and you know what you're doing and donors, they get that and they really do respect that. Great. So now I'm gonna ask you about five questions at the same time that are all related. Um, <laughs> the first one is uh, how many nonprofit organizations are currently CFEX certified? And then how much would it cost for a nonprofit to get CFEX certified? Uh, because, so, the, the, yeah. the, and what's the benefit to the nonprofit organization of getting CFEX certified? Uh, well, let's, let's start and go backwards. The benefit, I think, for a nonprofit to be CFEX certified is really the ability to have. So, CFEX certification is the end end of the the yellow brick road. It is when you you've gone through the process of making sure that your pro, that your 
fiduciary processes and what you're doing and how you're delegating and how you're getting service providers and how you monitor them, all those things are buttoned down. Once that's done, we use the same exact questions uh, that we've already done the work on in a gap analysis to do the certification. And so that is a very quick and very inexpensive step once you've had the gap analysis. We always do the gap analysis first because it, it, it is almost inevitable that uh, that when we go into to do a certification on an investment advisor, there are typically a small handful, one or two, maybe five, uh, are places where they can improve because the practices themselves evolve and improve. And so this is that cycle of continuous improvement. So we want to help them improve. And, and we see that as we go and do these annual assessments of investment advisors. And so to do the assessment of an investment uh, of, a, of a nonprofit, because the, these processes have probably been put together uh, by a board that are lay fiduciaries, they, they may not be complete. They're almost never complete. So we don't know what's in the box when we go in and open that up. And so it takes time and we you know, generally will have meetings over a period of weeks or months as we go forward and find out the processes, what needs to be done, what improvements need to be made and then have those improvements be put in place. And so uh, the gap analysis can be anywhere from 10 to $20,000 depending on how long it's going to take, how big the organization is, how complex it is uh, and, and what we have to look at. But once that's done, the CFEX certification piece is something like $2,500 to $3,500. So it's, you know, you're not spending $100,000 on this. It's, it's quite a bit lower. And as Alan said, I don't think that I've ever gone into an organization where they have not uh, ended up getting more out of the, it, it, that where it hasn't ended up paying it for itself um, at the very least, because we find you know, maybe uh, during this analysis that there might be expensive investments that could be, uh, that could be, um, that there, there are less expensive equivalents for. So why would you have an expensive investment when there's a, an equivalent that's less expensive or that, you know, a service provider is um, out of line with what is normal um, for a service provider. So those kinds of things can be very, very valuable for a nonprofit to know about. Uh, and um, and so, you know, we take our time, we do it right, and there's always improvement. So, um, Great. did I miss anything? <laughs> I, I would just add that, think of it as, how do I convey a sense of and enhance donor trust in my organization? And one of the best ways to do that is to be doing a good job, know you're doing a good job, and having an independent organization certify that you're doing an excellent job. That will go a long way in enhancing your donor trust. And what we've seen is donors who trust you tend to provide more and larger donations right. than otherwise. Great. So we've got about two minutes left. Uh, Ilona, can I have oh, you wow. go to the next slide? Um, just want to thank, uh, thank uh, Kate and Alan for uh, helping us today. And then go to the next slide, which uh, they, they have a fiduciary path has a fiduciary training. Just wanted to have maybe Kate or Alan just give a 20 second commercial on the fiduciary training that you have available for nonprofits. So uh, we have training that that is online on our website. Uh, the um, the website address I think is on one of the slides in your deck. Maybe it's the last one. Uh, but you can go there and sign your board up to take the fiduciary essentials course. It's a four and a it's about a four hour course. There's a twenty question uh, exam at the end. You can go through this course at your own pace. You can come and go. All of your answers are uh, re retained, so that when you you know leave and come back, if you want to do that, um, you're, they're all there. And then once you take the assessment and pass with a grade of seventy five or better, you get a letter from the Center for Fiduciary Excellence and a 
uh, certificate that you can display from uh, Fiduciary Path. Uh, and we are offering $100 off of the board subscription price. It's usually $2,499 for all of your board members. So um, it's a pretty good deal if you have a, you know, a good number of board members. Uh, so that would be $23.99 instead of the $24.99. And you can take it all online. Great. You know, Dave, okay. one of the things that the clients that have taken this have told us is that they found using certain mo modules in that training is an excellent way to get five or 10 minutes of a board meeting to refresh or introduce their board members to the key things that we've talked about here. So it's it, you right. can use it many, many different ways. When you sign up for that, you have use of it for a year for your, your board and staff and leadership. Okay. And then uh, lastly, we wanted to share this uh, resources page because there are a lot of uh, free resources to nonprofit leaders. Um, and I'll put in a plug for the last one on the list here, which is the way are, where are the lay fiduciaries, which actually Kate and I and Alan worked together on uh, back in 2021 to find out, I think we came up to the conclusion that there are more than 17 million lay fiduciaries in the United States. And a lot of them are looking for answers about how to do a better job at um, yeah. managing investments. And so uh, all of these uh, websites provide some pretty good resources for you. And uh, we wanna just, uh, both Elodium and Fiduciary Path want to hold ourselves out as resources for anyone on the call today that wants to learn more about fiduciary best practices for nonprofits. And with that, I would say uh, thanks to everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, we hope you found this session to be a productive use of your time. I want to thank, thank Kate and Alan for sharing their expertise with us. And please let us know if you have any questions that you think of after we sign off today. And with that, I say thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, thanks Dave. Thanks, Alona. Thanks, Elodium. <laughs>